this evening <coughs> going to explore the figure of Jesus and that of Socrates, <coughs> principally from the Gospel of Mark, since that was the first one, and the key one in the Synoptic Gospels, and Socrates drawn principally from the Apology with perhaps a few references to the Phaedo. I want to first take a look at the figure of Jesus. And I'm going to go through certain categories. And the best thing to do, I learned from an ancient <coughs> pool shark, that it's best to get the right chart up. I was wondering why there were so many blank pages on it. So, um, I'd like to first point out some interesting things about the figure of Jesus. He appears as a preacher, appearing in synagogues and in groups. He functions as a healer, miracle worker, and casts out demons. In the Gospel of Mark, <clears throat> the famous 1-5, um, there's the teaching of the baptism for the repentance for the remission of sins. And the key word is repentance, which of course means to turn the mind around, to turn the inner mind around. But the bulk of the teachings of the Gospel of Mark is that Jesus is not preaching for repentance. And he is specifically holding back teaching repentance. And I want to get back to that in a few minutes. His followers, the inner circle, the disciples, he brings them into the same role that he has. They too go out and preach. He assigns them the healing function and cast out demons <clears throat> and they preach for repentance. He doesn't, they do. Now, we have to see that role of repentance in Jesus so since so much follows from it. To do that, I want to take a look at the role he has as a teacher-preacher, because it's a very curious one, and it's in line with Cynic and Stoic teachings. Ah, as a teacher-preacher. Now, To jump into the most significant thing about the Gospel of Mark is that it is not a gospel that is central. He's not urging as a central thesis the role of belief. His primary teaching is for understanding. Now, The inner circle are given models for understanding. The people are urged to believe because without belief, there's no miracles and no cures. So for the people, the emphasis is on belief, cure, miracles. The inner circle is on understanding. One can build an argument from the text 
where there's approximately, depending upon how you uh, read it, probably 50 direct and indirect references to the role of understanding. It plays the central role in parables. <clears throat> now, in the fourth chapter, Jesus takes up the parable of the sower, and he very clearly in that unfolds the parable, and you can see in the parable the, the usual features of a parable, which are essentially the first one, of course, is that as a story it is extremely unlikely. It's extremely unlikely that anyone would hire a sower, such as in the sower and the seed, because he throws the seeds all over the place, on rocks, on thorns and thistles, on the road, and they finally land on a fertile field and multiply 60 and 100 fold. It's essential for a parable that it's unlikely. It's essential. It's one of the in important ingredients of a, of a parable. The second is <clears throat> that there must be something in the parable that is undecipherable without the person who understands the parable supplying you with the key. Therefore, it always has a key which is only known to the inner circle. And the inner circle is confined to the disciples and those about them. In the parable of the sower and the seed, part of the story is that there are birds that come down and eat the seeds that are on the road. And Jesus says to the disciples that I am telling the parable to the many, but for you, understanding. And what he does, therefore, is he sets up a one-to-one -one correspondence between each of the things in the parable and that to which it refers. So that when you have a sequence in a story or a parable of rocks, road, the brush or the thistles, then for each one of these there must be a parallel where each one of these must have its own particular meaning. When you have, therefore, a story with parallel terms functioning in a similar way, then when you understand it, it is an analogy. But to solve that analogy presupposes you have all the terms. Well, one of the terms of the story are the birds. And Jesus says to the disciples, those birds mean Satan. Well, since it's very unlikely that when people look at birds, they would spontaneously come to the association of the birds and Satan, that therefore it requires someone to fill them in with that unusual association. Because of that, the inner circle are given all of the key meanings but those in the public, the vast majority of the people, the, the majority of the people who are taught, it must remain a parable. If it remains a parable, therefore, it is unknown. If it is unknown, then it can't function for the same purposes to which the disciples are given the understanding and the meaning. Now, um, why does he do that? Let's make sure um, that we have exactly what is going on. To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables. Now he quotes Isaiah, and he changes one key word. He says, for to him who has more will be given, and from him who has not, even what he has will be <clears throat> taken away, so that they may indeed see, but won't perceive. They may hear, but won't understand. Lest they should turn again and be forgiven. 
That's why he wants to keep it in parables. He doesn't want them to turn around and be forgiven. That's what he says. Then he says, said, you, uh, do you not understand this parable? Parables, therefore, are to be understood. Then he makes the general statement about all parables. Then how will you understand all the parables? Therefore, all of the parables exist to be translated into an analogy. If one goes through the New Testament and collects all of the parables, they should then be systematically translated into analogies so that you have a whole structure of analogies, all of which are preeminently understandable. Why? Because he says, that is to grasp the meaning of the kingdom of God. So therefore, there's an intimate relationship between parables, understanding them, and analogy, taking analogies into a wide structure. Through that structure of understanding, grasp the idea of the kingdom of God, which is only disclosed, therefore, to the disciples and those few people about him. Now, what's interesting about the Gospel of Mark, <clears throat> and this is central to the whole Gospel, let's see if I can put it in terms of, a, uh, as an, an analogy, I put the parables in terms of analogy. As the parables, must be understood to grasp the idea of the kingdom of God. So the actual life of Jesus, as disclosed in the New Testament Gospel of Mark, must be understood to grasp the life of <clears throat> or the meaning of what Jesus is doing. Now let's see if we can see that. All right, let's see if we can do that. What are we saying? We're saying that built into the Gospel of Mark is the need to understand, to understand the life of Jesus, to understand the sequences in the life of Jesus in order that one can therefore understand what is going on through Jesus' teachings. Okay, let me do it again, okay? Therefore, we should be able to identify a series of events. We should be able to see that through these events, they become the objects, the objects of understanding. <clears throat> And therefore, the central teaching of Jesus is not belief, that's for the many. The object of the New Testament of Mark is to bring this inner circle that are carefully nurtured to a curious kind of understanding. All right, now, let's, let's uh, get into it very quickly. It's rather, do that rather quickly. Um, um, um. Uh. Okay. Yeah, okay, good, good, good. I'm going to just read a, a couple of lines and then ask you to follow the logic of these lines and you will see then that we can then bracket, we can bracket a whole section of the New Testament and in that bracket should be the particular events we're talking about which must become the object for understanding. 
which when you do understand, therefore, it intimately relates to the idea of the kingdom of God and Jesus' role in it. Now, the part I'm going to read, therefore, is in chapter 8, 14 to 21. Now, all right. Take heed. Um, as a matter of fact, I should read it from the beginning, shouldn't I? It's called, this section is often called the leaven of the Pharisees. Now, they had forgotten to bring bread. And they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Not curious, leaven associated with Herod. Leaven associated with the Pharisees, but we'll leave that for a moment. And they discussed it with one another, saying, We have no bread. And being aware of it, Jesus said to them, Hey, uh, why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Now watch this, watch this language. Very, very, very interesting. Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, don't you hear? Do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did, they, did you take up? Twelve, they answered. And the seven for the uh, 4,000? How many basketfuls of broken pieces did you take up? Seven, they answered. And he said to them, Do you not yet understand? Well, he's bracketing. He's bracketing. The leaven of the Pharisees, that's the key, right? Leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Well, if you go back into the development of Mark, you will see that these two events fit into a sequence in which there are, there is first the eating of the 5,000, feeding of the 5,000, and the 4,000, and particular episodes within each one, bracketing it. And he is focusing to them, hey guys, why don't you understand what's going on? That is to say, he wants them to take this as a sequence, as an object of understanding. Does anybody understand what's going on? See, he wants them not only to study parables, but what he's doing in a sequence of events so they can become objects of understanding so that they there and therefore can get an insight into what's going on in what he is doing. So his life becomes the object of reflection as the parables become the object of reflection. Now, um, we could go through each one of these episodes and it's a rather nice section uh, but it will take us longer than we have. But it starts at uh, what I call 614, where the story of Herod starts, so you can do that yourselves later. All right? So it starts at 614, and the episodes are very clearly, therefore, linked. And that is a perfect example, therefore, the point of the need for understanding. So every... These episodes follow in sequence. They have an organization. They become objects of understanding. The parables have to be linked together as objects of understanding. He doesn't tell them, believe. He tells them, hey, wake up, understand. Now, <clears throat> this idea of the kingdom of God is, of course, central to the whole development of the New Testament. And in Mark, it's happening right now. All right, it's not later, it's now, he says, Jesus says. Now, that means, therefore, that there's some intimate connection between waking up, coming to an understanding of what he's doing, and of the parables, 
which then prepares the mind to accept this experience or this state called the kingdom of God, kingdom of God which of course, by the way, Matthew changes to kingdom of heaven. Um, now, um, the, most, well, the most interesting thing in the life of any spiritual being, of course, is to be able to establish the range of experience and to see how that range of experience plays a role both in the individual's life as well as the life of the followers. Now, um, in Mark, of course, um, the most salutary, most greatest story, of course, is the transfiguration. <clears throat> now, The Transfiguration, chapter 9, uh, Jesus leads uh, uh, some of his followers up to the mountain top, and uh, he brings them to be observers of this event. And there is a divine luminosity. And it, through that divine luminosity, which is said to be so brilliant, it was uh, such that even his clothes shone with this brilliance came through it. And then, through that divine lum luminosity, comes Moses and Elijah. And they have a dialogue. They talk. They talk. Now, um... Wouldn't it be interesting to, uh, like the Buddhists, have these great koans in order to pass in, into the more profounder aspects of Buddhism? They give very profound koans, curious ones. I would propose that the interesting one for Christianity should be, okay, what do they talk about? How did that dialogue go? What were they talking about? Because this is Moses and Elijah. So now, would you not agree um, it would be worthwhile going back through Mark and every reference you find to Moses, you carefully mark and the same thing with Elijah. Right. Then, of course, having some historical background and reading of these people would be equally significant, so that you really want to take that reading that you might get through, background reading, right? because when Peter, astonished as he is through this, he says to Jesus as he comes out of this, he said, you know what? He said, uh, we should build three tents. The word is tabernacle. Now, it's always been a source of amazement to me that Christianity has ignored that. Because um, I, I think it would be interesting to see a Christian organization uh, build three tabernacles and have one for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, and present that as the core of their teaching, because this is the highest, most profound moment. And the matter of fact, <laughs> it's so designed that if you take the, the Gospel of Mark, <clears throat> you know, it's got 677 verses minus 12, uh, 65, <clears throat> and you just cut it down the middle, that's the event right in the middle. There it is, right in the middle perfectly symmetrical in respect to the book. And uh, it's structured in such a way, by the way, just quickly, that every event is structured in such a way that it has an incremental development. And on the other side, the development has a greater degrees of tension until it finally reaches that crisis in the end. So it's an amazing piece of work in terms of structure, and it follows... Uh, Aristotle, as you know, 
Aristotle did a great work on uh, tragedy, did the work on rhetoric, and the design, you can take the design of a Greek tragedy in the five sections in which it's traditionally built, and you can take it, you can put it right in here, and you can drop in the five divisions and put the Gospel of Mark in it, <clears throat> except for one part, and that is the part that doesn't fit is the, uh, what called the um, events after the opening of the tomb, or what is sometimes called the post-resurrection, or no, called post-resurrection scenes, uh, or sometimes people call it the the uh, uh, post-Easter, the physical appearances of Jesus. Now, what's interesting about the Gospel of Mark is that the earliest copies of Mark which is the uh, Codex Sinaiticus and Codex uh, Vaticanatus, which is the codex found in the Vatican Library, stop at 16a. And the uh, 12 more verses have been added, and the 12 verses, of course, deal with the post-resurrection, because they all, all of the ancient texts end at the tomb the young man in the tomb. Now, if you take that into consideration, stylistically then, you know what? What happens? You have a mystery. <laughs> you have a mystery. Then you have a mystery. Greek, Greek tragedy is a mystery. It's a tragedy. Well, then what would be the high point? This would be the high point, not the resurrection. Therefore, Christianity then would be, for the first time, uh, it appears to be the first 350 years, the Gospel of Mark had this appearance. It didn't have that end until many years later. Now, one of the astonishing things about the Gospel of Mark is its dramatic appeal to all readers. Well, good reason it follows the uh, structure of a Greek tragedy. But um, the part, therefore, that becomes very significant in the end, of course, is the trial. And the trial is very interesting because <clears throat> of several key elements. Now, if you keep in mind that it may have been originally designed as a tragedy and followed the same structure of the tragedy, it will help. Because when he is arrested and brought before the magistrates, the high priests, there, they can find no testimony against Jesus. That's what the book says. Right? They can't find any testimony against Jesus. And when they finally <clears throat> uh, provoke him, he, for the most part, he remains in silence until he makes one admission. Right? And they finally say, you know, just who are you? What are you? <clears throat> and he says, uh, um, are you this, uh, um, I, I don't want to, um, so I like reading it, so, um, hmm. The high priest, the episode of the high priest. Um, now the uh, chief priests and the whole council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none, no testimony against him. So the uh, high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, uh, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? He was silent, made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Hey, are you the Christ, Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you'll see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. 
Now, did he answer the question? Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? He says, yeah, I am. And you'll see the Son of Man seated in the right hand of power, coming in the clouds of heaven. What did he admit to? That he's the Son of Man? Oh, in any case, there is a question of how to understand that quote. Then they say, good heavens, you heard that blasphemy? Put him to death. Um, but all of the people are not that concerned. What they want to charge him with is being the king of the Jews. And it goes on again and again and again. And he makes absolutely no response to them. Are you the king of the Jews? Are you the king of the Jews? Hail the king of the Jews. Right? They mock him, crucify him, king of the Jews. Hail king of the Jews again and again and again. I'm the king of Israel, king of the Jews, king of Israel. Why is that so important? Well, you see, it's terribly significant because if he claims in any way to be the king of the Jews, then that's an insurrection. That's, a, that's an insurrection. He's starting an insurrection. He's trying to reestablish the house of David. He remains silent throughout this entire thing. Well, <coughs> what is it that they are after? Well, we have it very nicely in uh, chapter 15, 27 about Save yourself, they holler at him. Come down from the cross. Chief priests mocked him, mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, they shift the King of the Jews, King of Israel, come down now from the cross. Why? That we may see and believe. That's what they want. They want him to come down so they can see and believe. That's what they want. They want to put him to the test. Now, why is that so important? You see, because earlier Jesus says, that he will not do that. He will not, he will not reveal any signs from heaven. He will not make that clear. That's central to his teaching. So therefore, the end comes. And, and the uh, end, which is a tragic end, therefore, because he says in those great words, you know, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the story ends. It ends as a tragedy, you see. It ends as a tragedy. It ends as a mystery. Because if you take the earliest Greek text, <clears throat> see, in the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, it starts, this is the Gospel of Mark uh, of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The Son of God was added many, many years later. There's no, that's not there in the original, in the early copies. And when the centurion finally comes up, and he says, oh, that man, that's the son of God, the is not there, right? It's a, not the. So therefore, through the whole thing, the whole story, it's only the demons that call him and charge that he is the son of God. No human being in the story comes to that conclusion anywhere in the story. So therefore, you're left, I believe, if you were to read it in terms of the earlier text, the well-preserved, by the way, earlier text, you'd walk away and you'd be saying to yourself, what does this mean? You'd walk away with a mystery. If you walk away with the mystery, and internally there's a structure that invites you to understand it on many levels, then you have to go home and do your homework. You have to be brought up into it and reflect on it. Or you can take it as an object of belief and become like one of the many. And that's the way the story is structured. Now, let's take a look now. Socrates in contrast. Same trial. Trial. He's charged. He's charged. And Socrates turns around and says, ah, 
There's more than one set of charges. He said, there are three. <laughs> there's not just one set of charges. There are three charges. He says, there's an old one. And then there's the one that Aristophanes made in his play. And then there's the formal affidavit. He said, I'll review each one. I'll review each one. Because, he says, these set the stage for that. People believe this. They have a belief in the truth of this, and therefore they transfer it all to the affidavit itself. And the affidavit is really quite interesting. It's very, basically, it's, it's a, he's a criminal. Right? Uh, and uh, um, he, uh, the heart of it, let me just get to the heart of it, that Socrates does not believe in the gods the state believes in, but other new spiritual beings instead. So it's a religious charge. Same thing as Jesus. It's a religious charge. You know, what are you, son of God? What is your relationship to God? Therefore, it's a very interesting parallel. Now, Jesus is silent. His teachings are necessarily esoteric. They're given only to the inner circle. For Socrates, it is all exoteric, public, open, revealed. And as a matter of fact, <clears throat> what he does disclose is quite astonishing. Now, in the Jesus tradition, he places himself in terms of John the Baptist and earlier prophets. He obviously includes Elijah and Moses in that tradition of which he's a member. Separates himself from contemporary views of some uh, Pharisees, and, uh, but not all. But in any case, he's part of that tradition. And he sees himself as an expression of it, a successor, as it were. Same thing with Socrates. Right? Now, Socrates looks at these charges and he says, you know what, this is all, <laughs> these are charges. You know what the real charge is? He says, the real charge is philosophy. He says, that's what it is. People are afraid of this. That's the real charge against me. There's an ancient prejudice against philosophy because people have the idea that philosophy is something that the particular philosopher is really engaged in prying into things under the earth. You know what's under the earth? Spirits and those things. And fools around with trying to mess up with what's in the heavens. And he makes the weaker argument the stronger. It's just a sophist rhetoric. Mm -hmm. Now, Socrates, let me tell you how I got the reputation for being wise, because philosophy is the love of wisdom. He says, how did I get the reputation of being wise? He says, oh, I'll tell you why. He says, a friend of mine, Shafaron, went up to the uh, Delphic Oracle and asked whether or not uh, anyone was wiser. Delphic Oracle says, no, 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 no one's wiser. Now, curiously enough, what we find with Socrates, no belief. No belief. What does he do? He seeks, therefore, to prove the oracle wrong, is what he says. I'm going to prove the oracle wrong. I'm going to go around and test the oracle. And if I find someone who's wiser than I am, I'm going to bring them over to the Delphic Oracle and say, see, <laughs> you're wrong. <clears throat> now, what's most interesting about this dialogue, the way it's structured, is that a lot of people are caught up in, is he guilty or is he not guilty? But the real fun in reading the dialogue is to see that he gives all the evidence you need to convict him. That's all. He gives it all. Now, this is the center of it, that Socrates does not believe in the gods the state it believes in, but in other new spiritual beings instead. Well, right in the middle of the dialogue, he says, by the way, I have this reputation. And he says, you know what? That's quite true. I have a certain inner voice that comes to me, a spiritual thing that comes to me and warns me about things uh, not to do. He says, oh, yeah, it's been around a while. That's what I believe in. That's what I believe in. Yeah, uh-huh. There it is. So he believes in other new beings that God's state believes in. 
And then he shifts, and then he gives his relationship to God in this marvelous dialogue. And he says, let it be clear to you, he says, my, my relationship to philosophy is a spiritual one, right? It's a spiritual one. You see, the charge is, but you believe in other new spiritual beings instead. He says, yeah, I'll tell you about the spiritual part of my nature. He says, you know what? I have been commanded. I've been posted on my, to be a philosopher by God. He says, that's where I got my job. I was posted to be a God. That's it. And he says, you know what? I'll never cease from that job. Nope. And he said, you know what I'm going to do? He said, I do this all the time. He said, I'm going to show what is in me to anyone, and I'm going to speak in my usual way, not parables, not to a small group, openly, public, exoteric. And then he says, you know, when you think of it, he says, there's no greater good in the whole society and the state than my service to God. I'm a service of God. And he said, I'm in fact a gift of God. He says, that's right, I am. I'm a gift of God. And if you don't believe it, he says, you know what? It's not going to be easy to find another one like me. And he says, I'm in a long line. He said, you know, it's not going to stop with me. I'm in a whole tradition, successor. I'm in a whole line of philosophers. It's not going to stop with me, what's going on. Don't worry about it. He said, it'll happen again. There'll be another one. There'll be another one. They'll do the same thing. They'll kill him. It's okay. After all, you get that kind of a job from that kind of a boss, you might as well go ahead with it. Right? There may not be any retirement benefits, but I bet it's going to be a good job, right? <laughs> now look. Um, <clears throat> Remember the theme we brought up before we said that uh, <clears throat> what's the peak experience? Is there any peak experience Socrates had? Well, we have several examples of peak experiences described in the Symposium and the Phaedrus and Republic. <clears throat> but in the Symposium, there's a special one where Socrates was said to have stood in one place, meditating, and the sun was coming up, and it was during a campaign, so many men came out and watched. And then he stood there in one spot for the whole day till the sun set. It was evening then, somewhat cool, so the men came out and put out their pallets and slept around, and they, many of them wanted to see whether or not he'd move during the night. He stood in one place for 24 hours, <whistles> holding on to that one meditation. That's called the Mahasamadhi. And then when he got out of it, he did his usual trip and went away on his business as he usually does. <clears throat> now, what does he do with that kind of thing? Uh, what, do, what, what do people do with peak experience? Why do they have to peak experiences? They like peaks, no doubt. Oh, peak experiences. Peak experience uh, can be said to be... Uh, the highest thing that has been revealed to you or that what you participate in. And therefore, it has to shape what you're doing. It has to shape what you're doing. So therefore, from this scene, it's out of this scene that Socrates says, pardon me, not in that scene, in that uh, campaign, he said, it's, well, I'll give it to you. It's a great line, and I don't want to miss it up. Um,
Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll read you a bunch of quotes. Then, gentlemen, I'm at about uh, 28 in the Stephanus numbers of the Apology, page 434 in the Rouse. Then, gentlemen, I should have been acting strangely if at Potidaea and Amphipolis and Delion. I stayed where I was posted by the captains, by the captains whom you had chosen to command me like anyone else and risk death. But where God posted me, as I thought and believed, with the duty to be a philosopher and test myself and others, there I should uh, fear either death or anything else and desert my post. No. So he says, you know, if you were to release me and say, okay, no, don't, don't be a philosopher anymore. Many thanks indeed for your kindness, gentlemen, but I will obey the God rather than you. And as long as I have breath in me and remain able to do it, I will never cease being a philosopher and exhorting you and showing what is in me to anyone, any one of you, that, that I may meet by speaking to him in my usual way. And I'm going to confront each person, he says, to take care and thought for understanding, for truth, and for the soul so that it may be perfect. For this is what God commands me. Make no mistake. And I think there is no greater good for you in the city in any way than my service to God. Gold is to make the soul as pure, as perfect as possible. So if you're going to put me to death, he says, that's not going to hurt me. Now, therefore, gentlemen, so far from pleading for my own sake as one might expect, I plead for your sakes, that you may not offend about God's gift by condemning me. For if you put me to death, you'll not easily find such another, really, it's something, uh, I'm really something stuck to the state by the God. Though it's rather laughable to say so, and this is where he likens himself to a horsefly, you know, stinger. He said, you know why? He said, because such another will not easily be found by you, gentlemen, unless God sends you another and his care for you. Then I am really one given to you by God, you can easily see. Perhaps <clears throat> it may seem odd that all, although I go about and give all this advice privately, quite a busybody, one of the charges is that he's a busybody. I, I'm quite like a busybody. Yet I dare not appear before your public assembly and advise the state. The reason for this is, is what you've often heard me give in many places, that something divine and spiritual comes to me which Miletus, but he put it in the indictment. He put it in, here, that's what he put that in the indictment. <laughs> He's telling him. Hey, you see the indictment? I'm, see, I'm guilty. He put it in the indictment. Yeah, that's right. Something spiritual and divine comes to me. He says, hey, don't be annoyed at my telling the truth. The fact is that no man in the world will ever come off safe who honestly opposes either you or any other multitude and tries to hinder the many unjust and illegal, and illegal things and doings in a state. Hmm. So, now, look, look, now let's see how much he brings together and see how many people might fit into this as he gives now his final statement about his own life. <clears throat> I'm on... 439. But why ever do some people enjoy spending a great deal of time with me? One of the charges that he corrupts the youth. He says, yeah, a lot of people come around me and they copy what I do. Yeah, it's corrupting. Yeah, yeah, it's wrong. It's wrong. 
You have heard why, gentlemen. I have told you the whole truth. They enjoy hearing men cross-examined who think they're wise and are not. Indeed, it's not unpleasant. That is to say, they get a lot of fun out of it. <laughs> now he shifts and he says, and I maintain that I have been commanded by the God to do this through oracles and dreams and in every way in which some divine influence or other has ever commanded a man to do anything. <clears throat> That's pretty bold, right? I have been commanded by the God to do this through oracles, through dreams, and in every way in which some divine influence or other has ever commanded a man to do anything. So he's been rather busy where the gods have been busy with him. And the final thing is, you see, does he believe, does he believe in a way in which the state does not believe? Look at that charge, see? That Socrates does not believe in the gods the state believes in. Could it possibly be that we might be able to see that very charge in the last sentence before they go to vote? on his guilt or innocence. And in the affidavit, you know, there's the charge, and at the bottom is the sentence. So he knows, well, he knows it's death. So here's the last sentence. <clears throat> but I am far from, well, I'll read the two sentences. For clearly, if I should persuade you and compel you by entreaties when you are on oath, I should be teaching you not to believe in gods. And in my own defense, I should actually accuse myself of not believing in gods. But I'm far from that, gentlemen. I do believe, in a sense in which none of my accusers does. That's right. He believes in a way in which none of his accusers does. That's right, that's the charge. And I trust you and God himself to decide about me and the way in which you shall, and the way in which shall be best both for me and for you. That's his last words. Not forsaken. Right, go ahead. And so they vote. And they vote, of course, and the vote is tallied, and he's guilty. Now, in Athenian law, you have to vote twice. You have to vote to see whether or not the person is guilty or not guilty. And then you have a remarkable thing that occurs in Athenian justice. Now the guilty party can reflect on all that has happened, and they are now required to give an alternative, an alternative sentence. Then the jury then has to go back and pick death or the alternative sentence. Well, here's this guy who's been claiming to have a very special and profound relationship with God, and he sees what has happened his whole life. He knows that he's facing the death sentence, so what's his alternative? He's got a very interesting alternative sentence. and. Uh, Oh, let me talk about, just for a moment or two, about an interesting building in Athens. Um, there's a building called the Prytaneum. It's up there in the Acropolis. And when visiting royalty come to Athens, they can be lodged there for 24 hours, and then they have to get their own quarters. And men who have won the four in hand, the chariot races, three times, they can get the Pritanium for 12 hours. <clears throat> so Socrates considers the quarters and kinds of things he's going to have to 
worry about in his life? Oh, then, I'm, <laughs> then if I must estimate the just penalty according to my deserts, this is my estimate. Free room and board for the rest of his life. And he was known for throwing parties. <laughs> they had many a party where everyone got smashed and drunk and he walked away sober after talking all night. So people knew pretty well about this gentleman, Socrates. So they get the sentence goes back and guess which one they chose? Of course, they chose death. Because imagine having that guy in the... Blair House in Washington, D.C. for the rest of your life, right? <laughs> now, would you agree? Now, this is extremely funny, right? Isn't it? I hope it is. See, this is comedy. The other is tragedy. There's a tragic comedy theme between Jesus and Socrates. On a human side, this, is, this whole story is, is comic. It's really comic. But yet... In another way, it isn't. It's philosophic. So it leaves us with a rather curious puzzle. What is the relationship between philosophy, comedy, and tragedy? Now, the Greek world were absorbed in this question. In a town of 40,000 people, they would build a stadium for 20, 20,000 people. I mean, regularly, wherever they went, they built stadiums so that they could produce these great plays, and the plays were tragedies. They wouldn't go for one. They'd go for a trilogy. They'd go for a trilogy. Now, we go for one. They go for three. But they went for four. Because between the first, three, the third, the end, the conclusion of the trilogy, they'd stick in a satyr play. A satyr play dealing with uh, man in its most comic aspects, most often associated with sex. And therefore, they saw a tragedy and comedy. They went to these kinds of things again and again. And in the midst of this comes dear old Socrates. Right? <laughs> what is he? He's a combination of both in a strange way. There's something comic about the man. You can't have, help but laugh at him every once in a while. And on the other side, there's nothing... There's nothing comic about Jesus. I mean, there isn't anyone that even looks like they're going to break into a laugh in the whole story. So you have a tragic dimension and a comic dimension, yet both are related to God in a very interesting and profound way. And um, in the one, man feels forsaken by God, and the other one, Socrates, yeah, well, it's my job. Right. Got a good job. But he has one other aspect of it, and that is Socrates believes, if we follow the Republic, that what he is starting through dialogues, and dialogues are open and exoteric, and, are, and many of them now are, through Plato, a part of our tradition, right? that let this be a line. This is time or, or the flow of events. According to Socrates, some people can drop into this a seed. This is a different sower and seed model. This is, if you can get people caught into an idea, a profound idea, the more profound, of course, the better, then this has a life, and it continues, and the people who are around discussing it will be reborn again and again and again to return to this basic idea which was the subject of a dialogue. That is to say, the universe has an intelligible nature in which once one of these profound dialogues start, it proceeds through time 
people that are introduced to it come back again and again and again to pick up another piece of it as much as they can until they can then go on and carry the entire dialogue to its conclusion. Because we ourselves have basic seed-like ideas within us that we've picked up, and we play them out in patterns. And you know what? What if it turns out that we have to be reborn again and again until we get insights into the habits that destroy us? If so, it's very similar to what Socrates is saying in the Republic. This is his idea in the Republic. See, he drops seeds and he says, you know what's going to happen to you guys? You're going to come back again and again until you finish this dialogue. So here's a sower and a seed. It's a little different. <laughs> isn't he funny? I mean, can't you help but laugh at the guy? I mean, Socrates is really laughable, isn't he? Coming out and saying things like that. But it's, well, it's true. It Maybe true. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very, very curious, isn't it? And um, <clears throat> they're both after understanding. They're both after understanding. Socrates is going to try to bring them through dialogues, right? Open dialogues, exploring ideas, going to the roots, going to the sources of them. Jesus is going through understanding through parables and looking at his whole life. One is esoteric, one is exoteric. <clears throat> one ends forsaken, the other one ends with a smile. Jesus is in a tradition, Socrates is in a tradition. They both see that, they both see they're playing a role in time, significant, and it's unfolding. And <clears throat> There is a um, kind of recent theories about the origin of the Gospel of Mark from what is called Q. That is to say, they, they hypothesize a body of work called Q called, with the sayings of Jesus. <coughs> Pardon me. And they give it a tentative date of 50 AD. And Formally, it's based upon the common material that's found in Matthew and Luke, but not in Mark. And the question has been, why is it that the sayings of Jesus, which are so central to the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, why aren't they in Mark? Well, the sayings of Jesus, or what is called Q, are all open and revelatory. They're all open. Therefore, they don't advance the esoteric nature of the Gospel of Mark. Therefore, they have no need. They have no place for it. Now, what's interesting about Q, and there's some really very, very fine scholars that are involved in this, uh, and I invite everyone to get into it because it's really fine literature. It's been hypothesized that the sayings of Jesus called Q have their origin in a kind of thought that was current at the time and found principally among a group of philosophers called Stoics and Cynic philosophers of that period. They know the city, they know where they taught, they know when they taught, they've identified them. It's of several cities in uh, Decapolis at the time. And if so, then Jesus is continuing a philosophical tradition not necessarily pr nor primarily rooted in Judaism, but in the Hellenics, in the Hellenistic period. Now, the more that gets developed, the more we'll be able to see that we have one tradition that expresses itself esoteric, the other one exoteric, but they're both primarily grew out of philosophy. And that's what I wanted to take you through this evening. So thank you for letting me take you through it. Open to questions. Thank you. No. What do you find mysterious about that question when um, when the high priest asks Jesus if he's Christ, the Son of the Blessed? He says, "I am." What do you find questionable about that? Oh. That seems oh. to be a pretty direct answer. Yeah. Oh. Um. Son of the blessed. 
Is that equivalent? The question is whether that question is equivalent to, are you the Son of God? That's the first question. That requires some reflection. Next. If whatever this statement means, are you the Christ, the Son of, of the blessed? When he says, I am, and then describes what he is as the Son of Man, which part of the question that was asked is he answering? Are you the Christ? I am. Are you the Son of the blessed? I am? Is that the Son of God? Or is that? He says, no, I'm the Son of Man. And I'll be sitting on the right-hand side of God and will be coming on the clouds of heaven. So therefore, it is something that one must puzzle through. And depending upon how you read in the arguments you must generate out of the text to try to answer that, you go one way or the other. And therefore, it's a built-in puzzle, one of the great puzzles of the gospel itself. That help? Yeah, 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 yeah. Good, good. Um, a lot of other things we could say, but um, oh. the, the, the resurrection part of the gospel of Mark was added on later? Yes. When, when yes. time frame, when was that? Exactly? When was that discovered? Yeah. Or well, was it, uh, yeah, uh, to Count Tischendorf found the earliest... Uh, see, they were going on the hypothesis that if you could only find the earlier well-preserved Bibles with New Testaments, the mm -hmm. earlier they are, the purer they would be and less contaminated by additions and corruptions of the text. And so there was a great effort to try to go throughout the Near East and search out old monasteries, libraries for texts. And Count Tischendorf went to uh, the monastery at St. Catherine's in the Sinai Desert. And that was one that was built somewhere around the 8th or 9th century in the desert. Very difficult to get to, inaccessible. And he got in there, and there's a great story, by the way, that's uh, in several books, um, which I can recommend to you later. And he found this very ancient Bible, very well preserved in this monastery. And they've been able to date it at approximately 325 to maybe 340 AD. So, say 340 AD. <clears throat> now, Tischendorf is one of the really great translators, and he's really a self-made man, like many of these biblical scholars are. They're not products of universities, they're products of self-development. And, uh, uh, yeah, well, it's very important. I mean, if you want to learn something, I think it's better to learn it on your own than a university. You know, I mean, that's my, my own belief. Well, somehow he forgot when he was studying it that maybe he should have left it in the monastery. In any case, he brought it with him. <laughs> and it jeweled and crusted here or there. But, you know, I mean, he had been working on it so long and he just thought maybe it was his. And he gave it to the Tsar in Russia. But he print, they had it, he printed a, a copy of, of course, the text in 1879. So it's from 1879 to the present that this has been well known to scholars that that, that gospel ends at 168. That means the 12 verses that were added must have come after the 4th century and probably the 5th century. And there's a whole uh, volumes of, of arguments that seem to suggest that they think they know who added it in and when, and there's a big story about it, and it's very exciting reading. The, one of the ways in which they come to this conclusion is that all references to the Gospel of Mark before this date never mention anything about the resurrection. Then the other Gospel they found 
uh, pardon me, Bible that they found in the Vatican in 1475. The Vatican Library didn't know they possessed it. Someone went in there and found it. According to the story, I'm just telling you what I've read. Um, it's equally as old, maybe just a little old, maybe just a little older. Has the same conclusion at the same place, and therefore two independent works, not uh, coming from the same source, are making the same point, and that leads one to believe. See, all biblical research is based upon one word: likelihood. Right. And uh, the start of biblical analysis on likelihood was from Valla, Lorenzo Valla. But um, there are many modern Bible translations, like the Neb, the uh, New English Bible, where they make footnotes and they let you know that at this, the section after 16.8 is called the um, shorter version and another the longer ending. And they make the point that um, author this authorities believe that this is uh, later, but they don't make it as bold as I would make it, which is, hey, this was tacked on later. Right. But nonetheless, if you know how to read those footnotes, that's what it's saying. Yeah, anything more? Could I what, does it take, hmm? what does it take for someone to stand on one spot for 24 hours? Pardon? What does it take? What it, what, what it, what well, you're not in your body. You can't do it if you're in your body. You know, you have consciousness in your body. You're not going to be able to do it. Your feet will get heavy. You know, your feet will get tired. Mm -hmm. Best thing to do is get out of your body. And the way to get out of your body is to explore it in, in Plato's dialogue, the Phaedo, which is to draw the soul out of the body from all parts of the body, so it can remain separate and alone and apart from the body in every way, so it can participate in the nature of the intelligible or the divine. Very, very nice dialogue. And then that would be a maha samadhi. Uh -huh. yeah. if you can see part of this depends upon making comparative studies of other mystical traditions and then you can line them up. If, it's, if, it, uh, if that makes sense, if there's good reason for doing that, then you can make judgments in this way with all the caution that all comparative studies must have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you very much for letting me take you on this trip. I appreciate it. Thank you.